I do have a recurring dream. It has to do with exploring this endless succession of rooms that are empty and going from one to the next. And then feeling hopelessly abandoned and lonely and unable to find anyone else. That's a pretty good description of death. I mean, death is supposed to be a finality, but it's actually a loss of everyone you care about. I do have fantasies sometimes about dying, about what people must feel like when they're dying, or if what I would feel like if I were dying. And it's such a profoundly sad, lonely feeling that I really can't bear it. So I go back to thinking about how I'm not going to die. First of all, would you tell the folks your name? My name is Raymond Kurzweil, and I'm from Queens, New York. Queens, New York. Uh, and before we show the audience what his uh, secret is, uh, we have just a few seconds for Raymond to play this piece of music. Raymond, the piano's all yours. Thank you. Secret concerns something that he did, and uh, we'll start the game this time with Bess Myers. Raymond, that's a very unlikely sounding piece of music. Did you compose it? No, I didn't. $20 down, 60 to go. Henry? Was that thing written by a computer? Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I built a computer, and uh, by feeding in certain relationships and music, I was able to write music with it. Raymond, how old are you? I'm 17. Do your parents know what you've been up to? <laughs> My father is a musician, and he doesn't like the uh, competition. <laughs> Raymond, I'm astounded at anyone who can uh, do anything of all, uh, at all of this sort, and uh, I predict a great future for you. We were very you, pleased man. to have you with us tonight. Congratulations. Thank you. Ray Kurzweil is here. He has been called the rightful heir to Thomas Edison. His new book is entitled, The Singularity is Near, When Humans Transcend Biology. I, I read your book, some of the most frightening and yet hopeful stuff I've ever read. Ray Kurzweil is a pioneer in the field of artificial intelligence. He's an award-winning scientist and engineer, a millionaire several times over because of his invention. He's the holder of 24 patents. Ray Kurzweil. Was chief inventor of the flatbed scanner. A reading machine for the blind. Kurzweil keyboard synthesizer. This guy is freaky. Bill Gates has called him the best in the world at predicting the future. When Ray Kurzweil makes a prediction, lots of folks listen. He predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union, described the rise of the internet, and foretold the year a computer would beat a chess champion. According to Ray, you're going to have relationships with machines. <laughs> Computers will have consciousness in just 25 years. Kurzweil sees a day when microscopic computers will make all kinds of learning as easy as downloading. You're saying millions of tiny computers floating around in my head? Fundamentally, you're talking about tampering with humankind. Inventor Ray Kurzweil thinks that one day humans may be able to live forever. We come back to this book, to the singularity is near. What does singularity mean? When you say uh, uh, the singularity is coming, what does that mean exactly? And that's what you mean by the term singularity? What is singularity? Singularity is a future period which technological change will be so rapid and its impact so profound that every aspect of human life will be irreversibly transformed. There won't be a clear distinction between humans and machines. Our computers are not going to be these rectangular devices we put in our pocket. They're going to be inside our bodies. 
and brains, and we're going to be a hybrid of biological and non-biological intelligence. If you go back 500 years, not much happened in a century. Now a lot happens in six months. Technology feeds on itself and it gets faster and faster. In about 40 years, the pace of change is going to be so astonishingly quick that you won't be able to follow it unless you enhance your own intelligence by merging with the intelligent technology we're creating. So that's such a profound transformation that we've borrowed this metaphor from physics and call that a singularity. People are sometimes afraid of the future, and if you talk about what life will be like 10, 20 years from now, it may sound frightening, and so people imagine uh, destructive, dystopian scenarios. But in fact, technology has been the only thing that's enabled us to overcome problems. When I was five, I decided I'd be an inventor. I had this idea that if you put things together in just the right way, you can create transcendent effects. Other kids were wondering what they were going to be, fireman, teacher, and I always had this conceit, well, I know what I'm going to be. I started my first company when I was 18 years old. Since then, I've started quite a few others, over a dozen, I'd say. Well, in the old days, he'd come to me with some crazy idea, and I'd tell him, yeah, right. I don't have that reaction anymore because he's done so many things that I thought were impossible. Most inventors fail, not because they don't get their gadgets to work, but because the timing is wrong. People don't start a project when the hardware and the, and the technological capability doesn't exist to support it. But in fact, you should do that. And realizing that, I became an ardent student of technology trends. And this really started about 30 years ago. And being an engineer, I gathered a lot of data. And I began to see that if it was an information technology, that it followed exquisitely predictable trajectories, and you can use this then as a planning tool. I can now take projections for not just two, three, four, six years, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and invent with the technologies of 2020 or 2030. And I can't build those devices yet, but I can describe them and I can write about them, and that, that's been the source of the material for my book. I wrote the uh, book, The Singularities Near, which really tried to provide a scientific foundation for this concept to really look at the different technologies that are feeding into the profound changes that we're seeing. I do have a certain perspective on the future does come from scientific investigation, but it does result in a different perspective of what's important today and what the future will be like. And I see the common wisdom being quite different than that. And I think it's actually important that people understand what's important. In fact, I have an opportunity to talk to an audience for an hour. I'd I'll make a fair amount of progress in terms of convincing them that there's another way to view some of these issues. He has a certain vision of what's going to be happening, and he would like the world to know about it, to prepare for it. He's got a mission of telling the world about what's going to come in terms of technology. I'm really looking forward to this because the gaming industry really fits in well with what I like to talk about, which is the acceleration of progress. And I've been studying for 30 years the phenomenon of the exponential growth of information technology. This has taken on a life of its own. I have a group now of 10 people that helps me gather data in many different fields, and we make mathematical models of how technology evolves. When I came to MIT, I mean, I went there in 1965, and I, I went there because MIT was so advanced in 1965 that it actually had its own computer. 
took up half a building, cost $11 million. It was shared by thousands of students and professors. You needed influence to get close to it. The computer in your cell phone today is a million times smaller, a million times cheaper, a thousand times more powerful. That's a billion-fold increase in price performance that we've seen in computation in the last 40 years. What Ray does consistently is take a whole bunch of steps everybody agrees on and take principles for extrapolating that everybody agrees on and show they lead to things that nobody agrees on. And you shoot the messenger because the extrapolation leads to things that just, just seem crazy. He annoys people with the boldness of his projections of the future, which from my point of view seem to be based on um, data-driven systematic extrapolations of, you know, look, this is what's been happening. Why do you think it's going to stop? I guess I would say his principal tool is the exponential. People routinely underestimate what's achievable in long periods of time, like one decade or two decades, because they leave out uh, the radical implications of exponential growth. We can already sense how much more change occurs in a year than in the years before that. You speak to young people, teenagers, and, and even in their lifetimes, they can see how much more quickly technology moves today than it did five years ago. Acceleration of technology is the implication of what I call the law of accelerating returns. The nature of technological progress is exponential. If I count linearly 30 steps, one, two, three, four, five, I get to 30. If I count exponentially, 2, 4, 8, 16, 30 steps later, I'm at a billion. It makes a dramatic difference. About 40 years ago, Gordon Moore saw that there was exponential growth in the power of semiconductors, of chips. Uh, basically, every two years, we can put twice as many components on a chip. And because they're closer together, they run faster. And so computers get twice as capable overall for the same price every year. We'll make another billion-fold increase in price performance in the next 25 years. And again, shrink the size of these technologies 100,000-fold. So we went from a building to something that fits in your pocket in 40 years. In the next 25 years, we'll go from something that fits in your pocket to something that's the size of a blood cell. The reason that information technology grows exponentially is that we use the latest technology to create the next. So each new generation of technology grows exponentially in capability and the speed of that process accelerates over time. This is true in general of an evolutionary process. In fact, even biological evolution, long before even humans evolved, shows the same phenomenon. The very first paradigm of biological evolution was the evolution of DNA. That took a billion years, but then evolution adopted it and has used it ever since. So the next stage, the Cambrian explosion, when all the body plans of the animals evolved, went 100 times faster, only took 10 million years. After a few more steps, uh, Homo sapiens, the first technology-creating species evolved, not only took a few hundred thousand years, evolution then shifted from biological evolution to technological evolution. It took tens of thousands of years to evolve stone tools, fire, the wheel. And then we always use the latest technology to create the next technology. So the whole pace of technology has accelerated. Major paradigm shifts like search engines evolved in just five or six years. And the reason we get to a singularity, a point of astonishingly quick change, is because it's going to go into very fast gear over the next several decades. For me, Ray's projections are, are obvious. I mean, we are a young star and a young planet and a very young species in this 15 billion year old galaxy. People think of the human race as being this technologically advanced species. For God's sakes, <laughs> we've been technologically advanced for a whole hundred years. We've been the human race for a hundred thousand years. We are just at the very beginning. We have so much to go. We have so much to learn. We know nothing. Right after college, we had a 
a meeting. We kind of got together um, at a pancake house in Cambridge. And uh, he kind of laid out his, his goals at that point. And those goals were uh, to invent things so that the blind could see and the deaf could hear and the lame could walk. The reading problems of the blind may soon be significantly reduced. To the blind student, there are never enough textbooks and research papers in Braille or recorded material. Well, today, Mike Taibbi visited a Cambridge research lab where they've invented a machine that can make any book talk. Four score and seven years ago, our... The user can take an active role in his reading. He can back up your line over again. He can go word by word. He can have words spelled out. It actually it's started in 75 when there was this thing on the news about this man who had come up with a way that would enable a blind person to be able to read. And I said, this is crazy, this is impossible, I've got to meet this person. Obviously, it was a life changer. I mean, for me, it was really, really kind of big, you know, but however big it was, it didn't matter because, listen, for the first time, a blind person would be able to read his or her private information. It was an amazing experience. The current cost of 10 to $20,000 makes the machine practical only for libraries, institutions, or rehabilitation centers. The reader was very expensive back then. It had to be because the development effort was very expensive. So roughly 10 years ago, the Kurzweil reading technology began to become very prominent as an individual consumer device. See, it's very small. So this device actually, it's kind of bulky in your pocket, but this was our first model of a, of a portable reading machine for the blind. And a blind person just snaps a picture and it reads it out loud. So cell phones are becoming more powerful, and we expect very soon that there will be a cell phone powerful enough to actually do this whole technology in a cell phone. I think we may see a time when having sight or not having sight doesn't really matter. You know, Ray has taught us that we'll communicate by sending thoughts to one another over the internet, that computers will be embedded in our bloodstream. Everything Ray has predicted has come true, and I have no doubt that this will too. Oh. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Great to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's really Big, a pleasure. smart guy, and you got lost getting to Alexandria. <laughs> You've made such uh, remarkable contributions in so many different fields. I, I downloaded your Wikipedia the other night, and it took me half the evening to get through it. <laughs> I was just actually on a blue ribbon panel called Grand Challenges in Engineering, and uh, Larry Page and I wrote the energy plan, basically within 20 years to move to solar energy. All of us are convinced that within five years we will reach a tipping point where the cost per watt from solar energy is less than the cost per watt from coal and oil. We only have to capture one part in 10,000 of the sunlight that falls in the Earth uh, to meet all of our energy needs. So within 20 years, we could actually completely replace fossil fuels with nano-engineered solar panels. So energy needs are, are rising rapidly as all of these well, developing nations there's a lot of encouraging technologies. I mean, it's not the case we're going to go to the next hundred years with just increasing use of fossil fuels. If you ask what's the most important, most powerful phenomena in the universe, it's intelligence. All the problems that we struggle with today, you know, people worry about the environment and energy and health and disease and poverty. We'll be able to solve those problems, in fact, well before the singularity, just through the increasing power of information technology. The cause of 80% of the disease in the world comes from polluted water. Uh, there are very inexpensive technologies emerging. I know the inventor of one such technology, Dean Kamen. Small device that can take very polluted water and create very clean water very inexpensively. $3 billion, with this technology, we could meet all of the water needs of Africa. 
I didn't start with this concept that the future is going to be this remarkable change and work backwards to try to justify that. When I looked at the implication of what technology will be like and how it's going to transform our human experience and the world we live in, if you go out 20, 30, 40 years, uh, I began to realize what a significant change lay ahead of us. The three great overlapping revolutions. Uh, sometimes it goes by the letter GNR. And G stands for genetics. Really, another word for it is biotechnology, is mastering the information processes in our biology. And we ultimately will actually be able to reprogram biology away from disease and from aging. N stands for nanotechnology. In the next 25 years, we will have blood cell sized devices that go inside your body and keep you healthy from inside. That go in your brain and interact with your biological neurons and allow us to merge with non-biological intelligence. The third one goes by the letter R, which stands for robotics, robots. Really though, refers to artificial intelligence. And that's the most significant revolution of all. In about 20 years, I've set the date 2029, uh, a machine, an AI, will be able to match human intelligence and go beyond it. So artificial intelligence, which will give us not just more human intelligence, but will actually give us superhuman intelligence, uh, will enable us to solve problems that we're not able to solve today. We're looking forward to a time where we can back up our brains. Our brains will be largely non-biological, so we will be basically machines. We can stop aging. We can live indefinitely. Uh, all of our biological bodies are, are limited, and we need to deal with overcoming their limitations with one means or another. There's nothing good about disease and death as much as we try to ennoble it. People have had no alternative but to rationalize, oh, that tragic thing, that's really a good thing. But death is a profound tragedy. It's a profound loss of relationships and knowledge and skill and meaning. Some people articulate, well, we need to accept death. That's the goal of life, is to get comfortable with death and accept it. I don't accept it. A lot of things have changed in just a few years' time. So we are expanding at an accelerating pace our own frontiers and our own capability. And fundamentally, we need to get smarter by amplifying our intelligence uh, with this mental amplifier, which is our technology, uh, in order to continue this grand quest to expand human knowledge. Someone who disagrees with you is on the line from Knoxville, Tennessee. Hello. I'm a material scientist. I work at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I'm a big fan of Book TV, and the reason I'm calling today is to express my disappointment that you have invited this highly sophisticated crackpot and given him a national forum to express his pseudo-religious uh, predictions that have no basis in objective reality. It's taken me a while to get my mental and emotional arms around the dramatic implications of, of what I see for the future. So when people have never heard of ideas along these lines and they hear about it for the first time and they have some superficial reaction, I really see myself, you know, some decades ago and realize it's a long path to actually get comfortable with where the future is headed. The singularity is the point at which machine intelligence begins to amend itself, improve itself. Machine intelligence improves, improves, improves until we get to a point where, well, it assumes control. I think the biggest implications of the singularity are that we don't know the implications of the singularity. The, you know, the word singularity is a mathematical word. Singularity is sort of where the model breaks down. As in the center of a black hole, there's said to be a singularity in physics. It's a tear in the fabric of space-time. Things just change suddenly. There's no more smooth transition. It's going to be interesting to see if we can get through the next 10 or 20 years. When and if we reach a place where machines are more capable 
of doing things that we call thinking, the consequences of that as to who's running the world and which way will it be taken and how will we relate to it is hard to really understand. Eventually, we're going to transcend humanity. Eventually, we're going to go beyond the whole way of thinking, feeling, existing, and relating that, that constitutes humanity. The singularity is, is of mythic proportion. It's, it's an idea so, so large that we have to deal with it, even if it turns out not to be true. The singularity, like maybe some other mythic events, has many uh, definitions. One of those definitions is the arrival of a super intelligence that will very quickly invent um, solutions to the major problems that we have. And so that very rapidly we will have things like immortality, if not kind of almost um, superpowers. I think there's lots of things that Ray is correct about that he's completely off on the timing. There's definitely a lot in this vision of the future that's hardwired into people's own hope to see this before they die. So we have a lot of people imagining that the future is going to happen in 2040 or something just before they're dead, so they get, they get to see it. Immortality, yes, someday, but not by 2040. Stuff is scattered around. This is a Kurzweil Grand. It's actually a Kurzweil piano built into a grand case. My father had this bust of Beethoven. It's actually Beethoven's death mask. It looks like my father. People thought it was a bust of him. Uh, these are bound books of business deals, private placements, sales of companies. This is a table of awards. Got about over 300 cat figurines. Well, you're still living forever. <laughs> That's well, not just a salutation in her <laughs> family. Notes. Yeah, here's our patient's garden. It's a little after the peak. Yeah, I'm, I'm the why. assistant gardener. He does what I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> My father really loved gardening. He loved getting into the dirt. And he created beautiful things. We had the only fig trees in Queens that, that blossomed. So, uh, that's not something I inherited from him. My parents were involved with the arts, and my mother was a very talented artist. My father was a brilliant musician. You know, generally the conversations around the dinner table had to do with excitement about some new idea that had been discovered, either scientific or some social insight. And there was a great respect for human knowledge. That was actually part of the religion, if you will, of my family, of the power of human ideas and the power of ideas to shape human history and overcome problems. It was actually personalized, where, you know, you, Ray, could find ideas to overcome challenges. My father was somewhat of a tragic figure in that his genius really was thwarted. He was able to create magical effects with his music. It was a work of passion, but uh, there were many real-life challenges he struggled with his health, he struggled with financial problems of being a musician and trying to support a, a family. And also supporting his son's technology ventures. And if I had ideas, even if they were crazy, they supported them. Fred was very sick with a heart condition. And he had one heart failure after another. Very often brought on by him, I'm, uh, I'm afraid to say. Fred would work from early in the morning till never come home before 9, 10 o'clock at night. And I think it was hard on Raymond. 
you know, he needed a father, and his father was never around. He had had a heart attack when he was 51, and then he had heart failures, and he was getting weaker. He really worked hard to try to overcome these challenges, but we didn't have the knowledge back then. It just didn't exist. The problem with my father actually was a cloud in my life. I was aware that heart disease was uh, hereditary. We are fundamentally information. At the core of every one of our 10 trillion cells are genes, and genes are sequences of data. And they evolved thousands of years ago. Many of them go back millions of years. We have this old software that really is not entirely relevant to the modern age we live in. And uh, we're now understanding the implications of those programs and we're learning how to change them to overcome the problems that we encounter. How often do you get that done? Uh, I test my blood every few months, three months maybe. I actually had a pain right in my gut one day and went to the hospital and it turned out to be pancreatitis. Uh, my triglycerides were very high. Along the way, I was then diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I was 35 years old. They painted a very bleak prognosis. It was gloom and doom. And it freaked me out, I have to say. I started out on the conventional course. I was given insulin. That actually made things worse. So I had all the markers of a disposition to heart disease. We have to get really on this. This can be really bad. So then I began to really dive into this with, with my own approach. I could use the sort of discipline of gathering knowledge and harnessing science and leveraging it to, to overcome these problems. He's a great genius, but he also has another talent, his ability to swallow pills. He's, he's, he just, just <laughs> I'm faced by it, you know, what most people just find so yucky. He's okay with it, you know. So you're looking good. Yeah, well, you're looking good. <laughs> I work hard at that, but uh, what are you doing? Well, mostly I'm reprogramming my biochemistry with lots of supplements. I take about 200 pills a day, actually. 200? All the vitamins and all the minerals. Vitamins and minerals is the start, but it's really pretty aggressive to reprogram my biochemistry to be younger. For example, if your cell membrane is made up of a certain substance. That depletes over time. That's why the skin in an elderly person sags and organs don't work very well. You can stop that in fact, to reverse that aging process by supplementing with that substance. So that's, with, with that substance? Yeah. So that's, and, where you, and where do you find that substance? Well, I sell it, actually. I have a, <laughs> <laughs> I have a health uh, longevity supplement company. I want to live as long as I can. I don't want to die. If following Ray's regimen would put that day off, I would be very willing to do that. Life expectancy was 25, uh, 1,000 years ago, and that's what our genetic program is. Biology and health and medicine used to be hit or miss. Now we're actually going to be able to reprogram it, just like you reprogram your computer. I took some supplements and ate a diet and did uh, 
uh, whole exercise program that greatly improved my insulin sensitivity and completely got rid of the whole profile of being type 2 diabetic. We're actually gaining the tools to actually understand biology as a set of information processes. The fat insulin receptor gene says, hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well. <laughs> that was a good idea a thousand years ago. But that now underlies an epidemic of obesity. We'd like to adjust that gene. So when that gene was turned off at the Johnson Diabetes Center near where I work, uh, these animals ate ravenously and, and they remained slim. And they didn't get diabetes and get heart disease. They lived 20% longer. And there are quite a few, well, there's four pharmaceutical companies rushing to bring fat insulin receptor gene inhibitors to the human market, uh, which I think will be quite a successful drug. All uh, diet drugs on the market today work by inhibiting appetite, which is not really what we want. It's kind of like a birth control pill that works by inhibiting interest in sex. <laughs> I think human beings are a marvel. I mean, we are our bodies. There are not good genes, bad genes. There's a balance in genetics. We could do a lot of foolish things trying to alter human beings to improve them. The re net result of that might be tragedy. Ray is a very interesting person, entertaining, uh, kind of a visionary. He's not a biologist, however. And I think were he a biologist, he would be more moderate in his extensions and extrapolations of the uses of our technology. Engineering a better human being is going to be a daunting task. We've had five million years of field testing, and that has filtered down the existence of an organism that is very attuned to a range of environments and a range of talents and a range of possibilities. To upset that balance by exaggerating some feature is going to cost us something, too. We shouldn't just arrogantly think we have transcended the wisdom of thousands of years of human experience. It's the human body is nature's most miraculous creation, with perhaps the tangerine a close second. <laughs> but we still have a ways to go in developing this remarkable machine. As Samantha B uncovers in our new segment, Future Shock. <laughs> We're on a journey inside the human body. So what's it going to look like in the next hundred years? Famed futurist and author Ray Kurzweil is going to tell us. Future shock. Immortality. What will the body be like in the future? Well, the holy grail is nanobots, uh, blood cell sized devices that can enhance our health from inside. So we'll have miniature robots in our bodies. That's exactly right. We're going to become perfect. Well, how would you define perfection? The ability to blow shit up with your eyes. <laughs> Biology is very impressive and intricate, clever, but also very suboptimal compared to what we ultimately will be able to engineer with nanotechnology. We are building devices now that are at the nanoscale. This is a design of a robotic red blood cell. Conservative analysis of these respirocytes shows that if you were to replace a portion of your red blood cells with these robotic versions, you could do an Olympic sprint for 15 minutes without taking a breath or sit at the bottom of your pool for four hours. We'll be able to download software against specific pathogens, including ones that have never been seen before, not be subject to autoimmune disorders, and if you look at what will be, in principle, feasible with nanotechnology, we can go far beyond the limitations of our version one bodies. This issue is going to dominate our global politics this century. This, this is the issue that will color the century. Good evening. There's more computing capacity in a little grain of sugar when it's nanotech, you know, one bit 
per atom and, and flipping back and forth in femtoseconds. There's more computing capacity in that grain of sand than our human brain by a factor of, I don't know, billions or something. So, so that these machines, if we, humanity, if we decide to build them, we're building gods. My name is Hugo de Garris. It's a Frenchy sounding name. I'm a professor of computer science and mathematical physics at a Southeast Chinese university. I have a four year contract there to build China's first artificial brain. Artificial intelligence today, in terms of broad general intelligence, we're not talking about AI, we're talking AS, artificial stupidity. <laughs> we still have a long way to go. The basic problem is the brain sciences haven't taught us yet what exactly intelligence is. We still don't really know. Neuroscience is still, it's, it's still crawling. It hasn't even learned to walk yet. It talks. Where am I critical on Ray's point of view? Well, I think he's a bit naive in the sense that he doesn't give enough consideration to the, the possible negative consequences of these developments. His raison d'etre, his, his reason for living, is to create inventions that help humanity. So for him to hear somebody like me saying, well, <laughs> these, these inventions may end up causing the worst war that humanity's ever had, freaks him out. He doesn't want to hear such things. The nature of progress is is exponential, and if you really think about what that's going to mean for biology, AI, nanotechnology, uh, and the fact that all these things are going to happen simultaneously and they're all going to build on each other, uh, the future is it's going to be, I think, more fantastic than anything I've articulated. There's artificial intelligence all around us. Every time you place a cell phone call, send an email, intelligent algorithms route the information, Intelligent algorithms fly and land airplanes, guide intelligent weapon systems, make billions of dollars of financial decisions every day. And there are hundreds of examples of software doing what used to be done by humans. It's narrow artificial intelligence, but the narrowness is gradually getting less narrow. And the source of how to create more intelligent systems is going to come and is coming from the human brain itself. Even though there's a skull around our brain, we find we can look inside. And the spatial resolution of those scanners are actually doubling every year. The amount of data we're getting is doubling every year. And we're learning that we can actually take this data and turn it into working models and simulations of brain regions. And I think it's a conservative estimate to say at this exponential pace, we're going to understand how our brains work within 20 years. We will have this toolkit of how human intelligence works. And we'll be able to create similar systems that work just as well as the human brain, or even better. Computers today already can do things that we can't begin to do. Take those advantages and apply them to the power of pattern recognition and emotional intelligence that we have. And that'll be a very powerful combination. And there's one more observation. These artificial intelligence will continue to expand more than doubling every year. They'll continue to grow exponentially. Our biological brains are fixed. You know, a human brain has a certain amount of coherency, complexity, and we, when we have software programs of that complexity and coherency, particularly if they're simulations of human brains, uh, they will seem very human. And there really won't be much difference. I mean, there's nothing in our biological bodies and brains that we won't be able to recreate and in fact enhance, will create AIs that are real people. So, this is the house. It looks pretty much the same. I don't think we had the television antenna. Remember lots of uh, 
happy and sad times. So. Mostly happy. My father was very busy in my early life. When I was 15, he had his first heart attack. And then he was home more. We developed actually more of an adult, adult relationship. I became sort of a confidant of his. He would tell me his worries. I think Fred knew that he was dying. And, um, and if, about that, he was very brave. My father had gotten increasingly ill the last months of his life. He had actually difficulty walking because his heart was very weak. I got a call, I believe, from my aunt saying that he had passed away. The call was not surprising, but it was shocking. Uh, I had not really experienced that before. I felt frustrated in that Keeping him alive was a goal that kind of slipped through my fingers. My father was 58 when he died. There was this real tragedy of, uh, I think, a great talent that never really had completely the opportunity to express itself. I knew there was a reason I was keeping all this stuff, and he kept all this stuff. And I have got you know, all of his letters, and all of his music and all of his documents and all of his electric bills and all this stuff. Uh, I do plan to bring back my father because my memory of him is faded, but he still visits me in dreams. What happens in 40 years from now, and Ray dies, and he doesn't have his father back, what does, what, what does all this mean? What was, he, was he wrong? Well, he was right about some things. He's imagining a set of technologies that he would have within a certain amount of time before he dies. From my observation, the precursors of those technologies that would have to exist simply are not here. Ray's longing for this and his expectation, I think, is, is you know, it's sort of heartwarming, um, but it isn't going to happen. There certainly will come a time when an AI will say, yes, I'm self-aware, I'm conscious, and I deserve rights. The more subtle philosophical question is whether you can believe it. I wouldn't want to minimize the subtlety and interest of this issue, but I do think that once we create AIs that say they're conscious and interact with us in flexible ways, the philosophical problem will become kind of irrelevant, just in the same way it's irrelevant right now. I got to interact with you as if you're conscious, whether or not I believe you are. I think people will interact with the AIs in the same way when push comes to shove. Once we have an intelligence significantly smarter than a human, it will be able to do amazing, incredible things beyond anything we can dream of. And from our perspective, it will appear like a god, just as we would appear godlike to a cockroach or a mouse. And once you have an AI that's a smarter scientist than any human. It's 10 times smarter than Albert Einstein. Who knows what that AI will be able to do? By the 2030s, AIs will be millions of times more intelligent than humans. So that we're talking about a vast level of intelligence. So they could be assigned to create a person. For argument's sake, let's say it's a virtual person existing in virtual reality that is a very close replica of, of an actual person based on the information we have about that person. My work on this project right now is, in fact, to maintain and gather as much information as possible about my father so these future AIs will have something to work with. He was a pack rat like I am, and I have 50 boxes of his documents, all his letters, 
I have his music. Uh, this is my father's financial ledger. And I have my own memories, which are fading, but uh, this future AI I can go inside my brain and pull out those memories that uh, even I have difficulty accessing. Compound, dotted notes, correct. Execute throughout three quarter time. Uh, these are instructions from my father about playing the piano. He was my piano teacher. So with all of that information, I believe an AI would be able to create someone that would seem very much like my father. Generally, I always thought it was useless to keep all these dead, rotting bodies around. But actually now, it is useful from a practical point of view to have a place where some of their DNA is, is, is uh, accessible. People do live on in our memories and in the creative works that they leave behind. So we gather up all those vibrations and bring them back. Ray is a bit more of an optimist than is warranted by reality. I think the optimistic scenario that he portrays could happen, and I hope it will happen, that the singularity will just kind of bring more and better human life to humans and enhance us all. On the other hand, there are dystopian possibilities that are also quite plausible. There is no way that we will maintain a mastery of a superhuman AI that we create. I think that that's an outrageous uh, hypothesis. I can't imagine my dog really mastering me, let alone a bacterium mastering me. Once it's 10,000 times smarter than us, who's to say it doesn't figure out some way to reprogram its brain or our brain or for that matter, come into contact with the aliens in the next universe over who say, oh, finally someone's smart enough to join the club, and then, then they have their way with us. There's not much guarantee of what happens if we don't build an AI either. There's all kinds of other interesting technologies out there, nanotech, biotech. All these other technologies have their own risks, so it's not like avoiding to build AI is going to make everything deterministic and easy to understand. I think Ray is wrong to be so optimistic, and I think others who are more dystopian are wrong to be so pessimistic. I think we just don't know and we just can't know. I guess I'm best known for the concept of the so-called artelect war. The artelect, that's uh, two words joined together, artificial intellect, so artelect, uh, these machines might, for whatever reason, wipe out humanity. There's always that risk. Consider the analogy of the way we, as human beings, we look towards ants or mosquitoes as pests, you know. We, we kill them and we don't give a damn because we feel we're so superior to them. They are so inferior to us. So who is to say that, that, that an artelect which then becomes trillions of trillions of times above human capacities, may look, up, look upon us in the same kind of way. We, we could never be sure. I'm predicting that there will be a major war late 21st century between two human groups. So one group, they will argue that the only way to ensure that the risk is zero is that they're never built in the first place. But the second group, for them, it'll be almost like a religion to build these things because they'd be godlike. So you've got here the, the source of a bitter conflict between these two human groups. Then with late 21st century weapons, you're talking about a major war that, that will kill not millions of people, but billions. As a, a brain builder myself, am I prepared to risk the extinction of the human species for the sake of building an artelect? Because that, that's what it comes down to. <gasps> yep.
We can talk about technical solutions to viruses. We can talk about technical solutions to self-replicating nanotechnology. But to artificial intelligence, now you're talking about the most powerful uh, phenomenon in the world, which is intelligence. I mean, there's no magic solution. There's no, okay, we'll just put this little code in our software and that'll make sure that these AIs are never dangerous. There, there is no technical solution like that. If you ask what is the challenge of the 21st century, it's to keep the AIs friendly, as some people put it, but really it's to keep AIs reflecting uh, the human values that we want to foster. These AIs will be a lot more intelligent. Uh, they'll be just as stymied as we are today at the, at the limits of knowledge, but then they'll be making breakthroughs and that whole process will be a lot faster. And I'm using the third person, they, but that's actually going to be us. What I feel the singularity is, as we look towards the future, uh, we'll get to a point where either intelligent machines or cyborgs will start to dominate. Um, the singularity is the point where humans lose control. We are going to get to the Terminator scenario. That's what I see. Intelligent machines calling the shots. Humans, some subservient slaves is the best. Maybe on farms if we're lucky and so on. Looking at how we are ourselves now, I don't think the future is good. If you are a human after the singularity, forget it. Most people know me for the, the implant experiments that I've carried out. Uh, and this little pot here is the first implant that I had. But it was implanted here, and that identified me to the computer in the building. Hello, Professor Warwick. The last implant that I had was a lot more serious. Now, what we have there is an array of 100 electrodes, and that was implanted in the median nerves of my left arm. I then had wires running up my arm, and they came out onto a little connector pad, so we were able just to plug into these. Uh, I went to New York, and we put my nervous system live onto the internet in real time. We linked up to the robot hand, which was still here in Reading. So as the hand gripped an object, my brain received current pulses. What the surgeons found when they took the implant out was that the body tissue had grown around the implant, pulling it into position. Very quickly, mentally and physically, it's, it's part of you. I think once you link the human brain to a computer network, not only can you improve communication, sensory input, you can think in many more dimensions uh, and have extra memory, of course. That's the obvious one. I see as a person, I'm human, and I'm really limited and restricted in what I do. So if I could come out of the singularity, being mentally and physically upgraded, yeah, I'd go for that. So I, I don't mind changing dramatically from what I am. I believe fully there will be flash memories you can plug into your brain. We'll be able to hook our brains into calculators and statistics programs and have uh, Google directly into the frontal lobes. I mean, the, there's going to be a lot of expansion of the mind through interfacing the human brain with, with technology. There is an unanswered question of how far can you go and still be human. As we merge with machines, and I think it's inevitable that we will, uh, we will transform into something new. And as the technology becomes vastly superior to what we are, then the small proportion that's still human gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's just utterly negligible. Anybody who is going to be resisting this progress forward is going to be resisting evolution. And, and fundamentally, they will die out. It's not a matter whether it's good or bad. It's going to happen. Look at to the point where 
So much of the actions going on with our non-biological intelligence, and non-biological intelligence won't just be nanobots in our brains. It'll be computation out on the worldwide mesh, the cloud computing that's already emerging now of all the different computers in the world interacting. And part of our existence will be software entities out in that cloud of computing. If you go to 2045, we'll be spending most of our time in virtual reality. Right now, people spend some of their time in virtual reality environments, virtual worlds like Second Life. Today, it doesn't look as real as real reality, but you know, if you look at video games and look at how we've gone from Pong up to fairly realistic renditions today, same thing will happen in these virtual reality environments. These sort of exponential trends that Ray talks about are, are nowhere more visible than in a place like Second Life, where uh, exponential growth has dominated without uh, variation. It's interesting to see this, this sort of exponential growth phenomena applied to a world and realize, of course, that the virtual world is the one growing exponentially, where the real world, of course, is not. Ultimately, this virtual reality will go inside the brain, and then we we'll really will be full immersion with all, all of the senses. Virtual reality ultimately will have all of the features of real reality, plus a lot more that you can choose from millions of virtual environments. You can be someone else. You don't have to pick the same boring body every time. You can be different people in different situations. And over time, our biological bodies will become obsolete. We'll have many bodies. And we'll look back to the idea of having one body and being dependent on this one biological body and having no backup for our mind pile uh, as a very primitive time. Ray talks about the uploading of your of everything that characterizes what's human and what you know and all your experiences could be uploaded into the internet and run on a computer. And then you be, that becomes philosophical. Is that you? And if that goes on forever, is that immortality? I think it is highly likely that kids born today will grow up with the concept that immortality for their essence will be plausible. Whether, again, their biological package is likely to live more than us, for sure. Will it live hundreds of years or thousands of years? I don't think that will end up being a realistic issue or question to the kids being born today. They will have moved on to a better set of definitions and expectations about life and how it's packaged and how it's sustained. Life on this planet has had this evolutionary process. We began as single-cell uh, prokaryotic life forms, and then we incorporated technology the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum. And then that complex single cell became a multicellular life form. We are simply following that same exact evolutionary process now. We humans are going to start linking with each other and become this meta-intelligence. And we will eventually become an interconnection of the entire human race. And we will become godlike. You know, people don't like to hear that, but we, in terms of omniscience, being able to know anything, plugging your brain into Google, you know, omnipotent, being able to control something on the other side of the planet, omnipresent, being able to know the thoughts of somebody in Japan or Hawaii or wherever it might be at any time. And when I stop and I think about that, once you plug into that global network and you know the thoughts and feelings of millions or billions of people, to unplug yourself will be so lonely. God is who he is, and our challenge should be to know him, not try to create him. Okay, this is the open mic session for February 7th. Let's just jump in. We have a scenario laid out that the world is heading for an Armageddon. And you and I are going to be the generation that's alive to see all this unfold. If, as Ray postulates possibilities to the year 2040 and so forth, <laughs> There are biblical reasons to cause us to suspect that uh, we may not get that far. A biblical perspective is that man is going to get himself in a position that if left alone, he'd destroy himself. There's a risk here of starting to develop what would be called a pantheistic view of God, that God is everywhere or that we'll eventually become God. Th those kind of concepts can be very, very elegantly articulated, but they're also a path destruction. 
there is a danger if we worship technology. We start um, taking ourselves too seriously, not, not taking God seriously enough. Oddly, he called me up very sad and said he was lonely and missed me. That was very uncharacteristic because he was not prone to making emotional statements like that. Uh, he must have sensed something. That was shortly before he died. That was probably the last time I talked to him. Right. Well, I was thinking about how much computation is represented by the ocean. And there's all these water molecules interacting with each other. That's, that's computation. It's quite beautiful. And I've always found it very soothing. And that's really what computation is all about capture these transcendent moments of our consciousness. We're actually the only species that goes beyond our limitations. We didn't stay in the ground, we didn't stay in the planet, and we haven't stayed with the limitations of our biology. Just 200 years ago, in 1870, human life expectancy was 37. It's now pushing 80. According to my models, 15 years from now, we'll be adding more than a year every year to not just to infant life expectancy, but to your remaining life expectancy. As you go forward a year, your life expectancy will move on away from you. So if you can hang in there for another 15 years, we may get to experience the remarkable century ahead. We've spent thousands of years rationalizing death and created, in fact, quite elaborate philosophies. The tragedy of, of illness and, and death has to be experienced personally to really appreciate its significance. Losing someone you love is an unbearable happenstance. That's ultimately the reason you would bring someone back. I think people are kidding themselves when they say they get comfortable with death, they've accepted death. I think they're fooling themselves. So I realize that this mission to not die is really the right course. You know, it's not guaranteed I can't make a scientific case that, you know, I'm immune to everything that could happen to me. If I were a betting man, I would bet that uh, I'm going to make it through to a point in time where I can at least back myself up and have some protection against uh, the dying of the light.
Well, they have to cut the breastbone to get to the heart. Then they stop the heart. Surgeon repairs the heart valve. And then they just close everything up and restart your heart. And that's the end of the operation. I'm not living out on the web yet. I still have this biological body. And it's actually a biological body uh, with some genes that are undesirable. So I've been struggling with that all my life, and I'm actually in a very good place. So the incision was right here. I mean, I don't have great respect for our biological bodies. I expect things to go wrong. What I worry about is actually something might go wrong and there is no well-established procedure, and I'd have to do something that's experimental, on the cutting edge, or maybe there's nothing at all, and I would have to invent something quickly. I don't think we will recreate the dead, and I don't think we will download ourselves and our sense of significance into a computer. No, I don't. I, and I'm no different than anybody else. I dread disease and I dread my own death up to a point. But I wouldn't say I'm afraid of it. I, I'm a practicing Christian. I believe in eternal life. Will we conquer death? Not this way, not physical death. Death is conquered spiritually. If you look at the implications of my ideas, they do have a resonance with some traditional religious ideas. The idea of a profound transformation in the future, eternal life, bring back the dead. But the fact that we're applying technology to achieve the goals that have been talked about in all human philosophies is not accidental because that does reflect the goal of humanity. So now we're gaining more powerful tools to actually accomplish those goals. I think we are the cutting edge of intelligence and beauty. And we do have godlike powers because we can change the world, not easily, but our ideas are, are very powerful. Look at what they've done already. I'm hopeful because I think there's an awakening taking place in America. People are coming together around a simple truth, that we are all connected. All these different religious traditions describe God in the same way, as being all-knowing, being unlimited in terms of creativity and intelligence. And in fact, evolutionary processes move in an exponential fashion in these very properties, never becoming infinite, never becoming quite godlike, but moving to become more godlike. And so in that regard, you could say that evolution is a spiritual process. What is evolving is our own knowledge, our own appreciation of ourselves. We are a self-reflective species. We can use this greater self-insight to make this a better world. Thank you very much. I think he'll be, you know, in the long term, looked at as someone who was more poet than mechanic. His belief in this is complete, and he seems to have no doubts about it. And in, in that sense, I think he is kind of a, uh, a, a prophetic type figure who is completely sure and nothing can waver his absolute certainty about, about this. And um, so I would say he's sort of you know, a modern day prophet. That's wrong. He had a difficult, sad life. But he did, he did get a lot of joy from his music and his family. It's comforting, actually, to stand here. I'm not sure why. kind of a lovely stone.
I like that uh, passage. Yeah. This passing definitely doesn't end here. Now this technology does fit in your shirt pocket. <laughs> And I'm pulling it out now, and here it is. Hello, I'm Lucia, and they're Theory to Mobile. Oh. Wow. Take a picture. The uncertainty of exploration, proceeding to a specific location is a journey, progressing to an unidentified destination. Yeah. Is a <laughs> so much, but for all the work you've done, it's great. so much. And I just wanted to thank you in person for the reader. Oh, thanks. Yeah. You hold that one. All right. All right, good. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah. You don't have to uh, wonder about the singularity to see remarkable changes coming from technology. Look at today and how remarkable technology is. And it's hardly stopping. It's important to understand that these very powerful technologies ultimately become very inexpensive. These technologies start out unaffordable, but at that point they actually don't work very well. And as they work better, they also get less expensive. The computer you carry in your pocket is equivalent of a hundred million dollar computer of a few decades ago. The tools change the world and are in everybody's hands. Today, you can take an information file and turn it into a movie, a recorded album, a book. But the real promise of nanotechnology is to have a tabletop device, and you can take an information file and turn it into a physical object. You can print out a blouse. You can email someone a toaster or the toast or a module from which you can then build a house. From very inexpensive input materials, we'll create everything we need. So we are very lucky. I mean, this is the cornucopia of this explosion of, of information, and ultimately information will be everything. In the future, everything will become intelligent. Nanobots will infuse all the matter around us with information. Rocks, trees, everything will become these intelligent computers. So at that point, we're gonna expand out into the rest of the universe. We will be sending basically nanotechnology infused with artificial intelligence. Swarms of those will go out into the universe and basically find other matter and energy that we can then harness to expand the overall intelligence of our human machine civilization. So the universe will wake up, it'll become intelligent, and that will multiply our intelligence trillions of trillions fold. You know, we can't really fully contemplate. And that's really the main reason this is called the singularity. But regardless of what you call it, it will be the universe waking up. So does God exist? Well, I would say not yet.